In today's video, we're continuing our coverage of the crypto exchange Coinbase and its ongoing legal battle with the SEC. In previous videos, we've looked at the SEC's allegation that many of the coins listed by Coinbase are securities. Therefore, Coinbase is illegally acting as an unregistered securities broker. If the SEC wins the lawsuit, Coinbase would likely be forced to pay billions of dollars in fines and delist the majority of coins from their platform. This would be financially catastrophic for the company. Unsurprisingly, Coinbase has vigorously denied all allegations of wrongdoing. They claim that none of the 250 coins they offer are securities. After the SEC filed the complaint, Coinbase filed a motion to dismiss the case. In the motion to dismiss, Coinbase argues that the case is meritless and the judge should throw it out. The motion was heard by District Judge Catherine Fela. She denied the motion and ruled that the SEC has a plausible case against Coinbase. To be clear, Coinbase has not yet been found guilty. This just means that the case will go to a trial and a jury will decide the crypto exchange's fate. What's interesting about this ruling is it gives us some key insights about Coinbase's defense strategy. In this video, we'll look at the SEC's arguments, Coinbase's arguments, and why the judge sided with the SEC. The SEC has three main allegations. Firstly, Coinbase is acting as an unregistered securities broker because at least some of the coins it lists are securities. Secondly, Coinbase's staking feature is also a security. And thirdly, Coinbase Wallet is also a broker of unregistered securities. The judge is allowing the first two allegations to move forward, but she struck down the third allegation about the Coinbase Wallet. The wallet can link with a multitude of third-party platforms to facilitate transactions. Customers can use the Coinbase Wallet to store coins not listed on the Coinbase Exchange. While the Coinbase wallet is capable of holding crypto securities, the judge believes that Coinbase is not acting as a broker in this situation. While this is technically a partial win for Coinbase, they generate little, if any, revenue from the Coinbase wallet. The coins traded directly on the Coinbase exchange, as well as staking, are far bigger moneymakers for the company. Let's first look at the coins listed on the Coinbase exchange. Currently, Coinbase has over 250 coins available for its customers to trade. For the SEC to win the case, they only have to prove that at least one of these coins is a security. The judge decided to focus on two of the coins, Solana and Chili's. The Solana coin was created by Solana Labs. Solana Labs is a for-profit company headquartered in San Francisco. They have between 11 and 50 employees according to LinkedIn. Third-party developers can build so-called decentralized apps on top of the Solana blockchain. Most of the third-party applications appear to be related to decentralized finance and NFTs. There are transaction fees associated with using the Solana blockchain. Some of the proceeds from these fees are used to buy back Solana coins on the open market. The coins that are bought back are destroyed. The more people that use the Solana blockchain, the more fees will be generated, and the more Solana coins will be bought back. This will theoretically increase the trading price of the Solana coin. It's conceptually similar to how a publicly traded company may use its profits to buy back some of its own shares. To fund its operations, Solana Labs engaged in a number of coin offerings. In total, they've raised over $300 million by selling newly issued Solana coins. So what do they do with the money? They use some of this money to finance their social media and YouTube channels. The purpose of these channels is presumably to convince more people to use the Solana blockchain. As the market value of the Solana coin has increased, its founders have become very wealthy. Of the 500 million initially minted Solana coins, 12.5 of them were allocated to the company's founders, and another 12.5% of them were allocated to the Solana Foundation. The second token the judge analyzed was the Chili's coin. Chili's claims to be building Web3 infrastructure for sports and entertainment. They partnered with various professional sports teams. People can buy branded fan tokens representing the sports team. Ownership of these coins allows the owner to vote on some of the team decisions, such as the choice of apparel. The voting is done on the Socios.com website and its associated smartphone app. Chili's raised $66 million from an initial coin offering. They have used these proceeds to expand their relationships with sports teams and market their coin, among other uses. 8% of Chili's coins were given to the project's founders and advisory board. Similar to Solana, there are transaction fees. A portion of these transaction fees are used to buy back Chili's coins on the open market and burn them. Socios appears to be owned and operated by the Chili's team. Without the ongoing efforts of the Socios' employees, the platform would not function and the Chili's cryptocurrency would presumably have no use case. Thus, the value of the Chili's coin is largely dependent on Socios, which is a centralized organization. Finally, Coinbase has a staking feature. Some cryptocurrencies, including Ethereum, use a proof-of-stake system. Under this system, investors can stake their coins and earn interest. Coinbase can stake customers' coins on their behalf. 
In exchange, Coinbase charges a fee of between 25 and 35% of the staking yield. Now that we've established what Coinbase does, we can move on to the legal arguments. Before getting into the substantive arguments, let's first look at some of the legal technicalities that Coinbase attempted to employ. They tried to invoke the so-called Major Questions Doctrine. The idea is that a government agency cannot unilaterally expand its power over novel matters that have vast economic or political significance. Such an expansion of authority requires passage of new laws by Congress. One example of this is the Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Power Plan proposed in 2014. This regulation would require states to decrease their carbon emissions, in part by switching to renewable electricity generation. The EPA claimed they had the authority to do this under the Clean Air Act passed in 1970. It was unclear whether the Clean Air Act gave the EPA the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. It's important to remember that climate change was not widely accepted amongst the scientific community until the 1980s. When the Clean Air Act was passed in 1970, lawmakers likely did not intend that the EPA would regulate carbon dioxide. After a lengthy legal battle, the US Supreme Court ultimately decided that the EPA overstepped its authority. Their proposed rules could have massive economic implications. They can only exercise such power if it is explicitly and affirmatively given to them by a new act of Congress. So how does this relate to Coinbase? Coinbase tried to argue that cryptocurrencies represent an area of vast economic importance. Obviously, when the Securities and Exchange Act was written almost 100 years ago, there was no crypto. Coinbase argues that the SEC does not have the authority to regulate crypto, as Congress never specifically gave them the power to do this. The judge rejected this argument for two reasons. Firstly, the major questions doctrine is only applicable in extreme situations. In the case of the Clean Power Plan, the EPA's proposed regulations would have given itself the power to reshape the entire US energy grid. The economic significance of this is undeniable. While the importance of the crypto market is debatable, it is nowhere nearly as important as the energy grid. Real-world use cases of cryptocurrencies are few and far between. While crypto bulls argue its economic importance will increase in the future, this is speculative at best. More importantly, when Congress created the SEC, they knew that unscrupulous actors could create creative financial instruments in an attempt to circumvent regulations, so they intentionally gave the SEC extremely broad jurisdiction. It is likely within the original legislative intent that the SEC would look into unforeseeable financial innovations such as cryptocurrencies. The second technicality that Coinbase tried to invoke was the Administrative Procedure Act or APA. Under the APA, regulatory agencies are required to provide individuals or entities fair warning that their conduct is prohibited before commencing an enforcement action. Specifically, they point to the congressional testimony given by SEC Chair Gary Gensler in May of 2021, more than a year before filing the lawsuit. In the testimony, Gensler indicated that only Congress could address any gap in the SEC's ability to regulate crypto exchanges. Coinbase is trying to imply that even Gensler knows that he doesn't have the authority to regulate crypto. Coinbase argues that this provided the crypto industry with the understanding that they operated outside the SEC's jurisdiction. Thus, the subsequent enforcement action was unexpected and a violation of the APA. As it turns out, Coinbase was taking Gensler's quote out of context. He wasn't saying that the SEC doesn't have the authority to regulate crypto. He was saying the SEC would regulate crypto under existing securities laws. If there are aspects of the crypto market that would need a new legal framework, this is for Congress to decide. But if the SEC considers a cryptocurrency to be a security, they will apply the exact same legal framework they use for any security. All the way back in 2019, the SEC published the Framework for Investment Contract Analysis of Digital Assets. They said that if a cryptocurrency satisfies the Howey test, it is a security and must be registered. Thus, the SEC's position has been consistent. They may have jurisdiction over some cryptocurrencies, depending on the individual facts and circumstances of each coin. Coinbase claims that they review potential coin listings by applying the Howey test and only list coins which they believe are not securities. The SEC clearly has a different interpretation of the Howey test, but the fact that Coinbase attempted to apply the Howey test indicates that they knew an SEC enforcement action was a possibility. This undermines their arguments about the APA. With the technical arguments resolved in the SEC's favor, we can move on to the substantive debate of whether the cryptocurrencies in question are securities. The key debate revolves around the so-called Howey test. Coinbase claims to conduct the Howey test on every coin it lists, but their interpretation is very different from that of the SEC. The Howey test defines a security as an investment contract that constitutes an investment of money in a common enterprise, with a reasonable expectation of profit derived from the efforts of others. It is self-evident that substantially all the transactions on the Coinbase platform constitute investments of money. 
Coinbase further concedes that at least in some cases, customers who buy the coins are doing so with the expectation of profit. Most of Coinbase's arguments revolve around the investment contract, common enterprise, and efforts of others. Coinbase's first argument is that none of the cryptocurrencies on its platform represent investment contracts. Securities, such as shares in a company, are contracts. The company is legally bound to honor the terms of the contract. For example, if you go on your brokerage account and buy a share of Apple stock, you personally haven't signed any contract with Apple. Nevertheless, Apple is required to honor your rights as a shareholder. For example, if they distribute the profits as a dividend, you're legally entitled to your dividends as a shareholder. Coinbase argues that issuers of cryptocurrencies have no such obligation to the buyers of the coins. Therefore, the coins are no investment contracts. As we discussed previously, the definition of a security is intentionally broad. The analysis should revolve around the economic reality of the financial arrangement, not the form in which it takes. Based on prior legal precedent, it has been established that an enforceable written contract is not required to establish an investment contract in the context of the Howey test. You can also consider the expectations and understandings of market participants. The issuers of cryptocurrencies often produce marketing materials such as a white paper, investment presentations, etc. These materials provide an understanding of what the investors can expect from the coins and what the issuers of the coins are expected to do going forward. Thus, while not an enforceable contract, the crypto white papers act as a de facto contract. The next issue is a common enterprise. To satisfy the Howey test, the profits the investor expects must be the result of a common enterprise. Let's look at an example in traditional finance. A company issues a stock. The company generates profits. As owners of the company, each shareholder is entitled to a share of the profits. This profit can be distributed via dividends. Coinbase argues that crypto investors are not entitled to any profits. Therefore, any gains they receive are not the result of a common enterprise. However, the word profit can be broadly defined. The Supreme Court has previously ruled that profits can include dividends, periodic payments such as the coupon of a bond, or capital appreciation. There is no meaningful distinction between a dividend payment and capital appreciation. The crypto issuer creates a common enterprise, and the investors profit if the value of the coin increases. Now we're on to the issue of the efforts of others. Coinbase argues that while many buyers of cryptocurrencies expect to make an economic return, this is not based on the efforts of others. While the founders of the coin may make statements about how they plan to develop the crypto ecosystem in the future, they have no legally enforceable obligation to follow through on these plans. To support their position, Coinbase cites a court case from 1979, Deleuze Rancho's Investment LTD versus Coldwell Banker & Co. This case concerned the sale of undeveloped land. The seller of the land claimed the value could increase because they build communal facilities in the vicinity. A court ruled that this was not an investment contract because the buyer had no way of compelling the seller to follow through on this promise. Judge Fela says this is a poor comparison. In the case of undeveloped land, the land itself has some intrinsic value. Even if the seller fails to build communal facilities, the land can potentially still be developed. The buyer could also build these communal facilities himself. So while the decision to buy the undeveloped land may be influenced to some extent by the promised efforts of the seller, the buyer's profits are not solely dependent on the efforts of others. The Howey test has gray areas, and this is one of them. The SEC's case against Coinbase is much less gray. Remember that the SEC only has to prove that one of the coins is a security. So let's take the most clear-cut example, which is the Chili's coin. The entire premise of the Chili's ecosystem revolves around the partnerships with sports teams. The enterprise is run solely by the issuers of the coin. If this enterprise fails, the Chili's coin would still exist, but it would have zero value. In this way, it's very similar to a stock. Take the example of First Republic Bank, which went bankrupt last year. Its stock technically still exists. If you want to, you can buy it on the over-the-counter markets. But because the underlying company went bankrupt, the stock is substantially worthless. It's hard to argue that the Chili's coin is any different from a stock in this regard and a stock is clearly a security, nobody would argue with that. For the next portion of analysis, we need to talk about Beanie Babies. Beanie Babies were small stuffed animals made by the toy company Thai Inc. in the 1990s. Thai Inc. made many different types of Beanie Babies, some of them in limited edition runs. Due to the scarcity value, the limited edition Beanie Babies became more desirable. In some cases, they could be resold on the secondary market for higher than their original price. While they were originally intended for kids, eventually adults started buying them as speculative investments. A speculative bubble formed. At the peak, this led to bizarre cases, including a husband and wife splitting up their shared Beanie Baby collection at divorce court. In recent years, many skeptics have mockingly compared cryptocurrencies to Beanie Babies. 
they have no intrinsic value and are completely dependent on the greater fool theory. In an ironic twist of fate, Coinbase's lawyers have also compared cryptocurrencies to Beanie Babies. A Coinbase lawyer argued that if you bought shares in Thai Inc, that would be a security. But if you buy a Beanie Baby from Thai Inc, this is not a security. The cryptocurrencies sold on Coinbase are more similar to Beanie Babies than an equity stake of Thai Inc. Regulating Beanie Babies as securities would clearly be ridiculous. Judge Fela did not buy this argument. The crypto issuers tell their investors that they will use the proceeds from their coin issuance to invest in the ecosystem. This will ultimately increase the value of the coins. This is fundamentally different from Beanie Babies. Thai Inc. never said it would reinvest the revenue to increase the hype around Beanie Babies or anything of that sort that would cause the prices of Beanie Babies to increase on the secondary markets. They were just a toy company making stuffed animals for kids. The final issue is staking. Regardless of whether the underlying coins are securities, the SEC alleges that the service Coinbase provides to stake coins on customers' behalf is itself a security. This is because the customer is relying on Coinbase's efforts to generate a profit from their coins. Coinbase argued that staking does not constitute an investment of money because there is no risk of loss. If you stake Ether coins, you might suffer a loss in USD terms if the price of Ether falls, but you won't lose your Ether coins. However, the judge decided that there was a risk of loss. While improbable, Coinbase could be hacked or the consensus mechanism could theoretically forfeit the staked coins. Overall, things are not looking good for Coinbase. The SEC looks to have a pretty strong case. With that being said, complex civil trials like this can take a long time. It could be years before the expected jury trial concludes. In the meantime, this ruling provides some interesting insights for investors. If the SEC is right and cryptocurrencies are unregistered securities, it's probably not a good idea to invest in them given the risks of fraud and manipulation. If Coinbase is right and cryptocurrencies are more like Beanie Babies, it's probably also not a good idea to invest in them. Alright guys, that wraps it up for this video. What do you think about Coinbase? Let us know in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Wall Street Millennial, signing out.